Hello and welcome to Unipass Market Insights. Thanks for tuning in again. My name is Florian Oberländer and finally on my side again, our chief analyst, Mr. Gregor Petz. Hello, Gregor. Hello, Florian. It was quite lonely without you the last time around. Yeah, same for me. So I'm glad to be back. Happy to be back, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I prepared some nice topics, some good questions for you. There will be a discussion about the industrial electricity price. We will talk about storages. Mm -hmm. Then you will answer the questions of our next generation, the trainees and mm -hmm. apprentices. Okay. Two of them are actually here in the audience today. Uh, so hopefully we get a thumbs up later on. Mm -hmm. And then, um, of course, we want to talk about the so-called Dunkelflaute, the dark uh, doldrums, and uh, that's the English word, and that's been in the press lately. Absolutely. Um, so maybe we start with explaining to the people what this actually means. Yeah, that's fairly easy, at least in, in the German language. It means the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't uh, blow. So yeah. a flaute is a nautical term, from uh, which means there's no, no, no wind. Um, so, and that is, of course, uh, for a, a system that is dominated by renewable energy sources or yeah. largely influenced by uh, renewable energy sources is a problem because energy production is then low because you have no PV in feed and your turbines are not producing energy as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation. It's quite easy. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. not a, it's not a chapter in a Harry Potter book or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it sounds like. The German Federal Cartel Office looked at the dark doldrums in 2024 mm -hmm. and came out with a study. And I want to quote this here. Dark doldrums such as these occurred in November and December 2024 mm -hmm. will continue in the future. So this year uh, probably as well to ensure that sufficient generation capacity is available for such situations. In the long term, the federal network agency, so the Bundesnetzagentur, continues to consider that legislative measures for the expansion mm -hmm. of controllable capacity to be urgently necessary. In layman's terms, what does that mean? Uh, it means that if you have uh, large parts of your generation influenced by weather, mm -hmm. you need generation that is independent of weather. In today's technologies, that pr means gas, coal, something like yeah. that, nuclear to an extent. We don't have nuclear in Germany. We are phasing out coal. Uh, so it means we probably need gas or eventually hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, we need generation that we can switch on and switch off when the customer needs uh, the energy and not when the wind or the sun uh, produces energy. Mm -hmm. And also in the press, it's always stated that it leads to extreme price spikes. Yeah. But of course, we as an uh, energy uh, generator as well, um, it's not as black and white as it sometimes seems to mm -hmm. be. Can you maybe explain a little bit what are the reasons behind it? Yeah, of course. I mean, this is obviously um, a system where we have e equilibrium prices, where supply and demand meet. Mm -hmm. yeah? And in our area here, we have uh, quarterly, hourly prices mm -hmm. um, that are traded in the, sh in the short term. Which means if you have an, an overlay of a demand that is driven by what we all do. Yeah? So, for example, we go home in the evening, we switch the light on, plug the EV in to be charged and we turn the television on or the computer. Yeah. And, and that consumes energy. And at the same time, you have a system where uh, wind and weather influence the infeed. And if in the evening now it's dark yeah, and if the wind doesn't blow, then of mm -hmm. course you see a price spike because everybody wants to consume the, uh, the energy. Mm -hmm. So, And that is then shown in these uh, prices, in the short term prices, and they can go easily to 200 euros or, or more mm -hmm. and if, if supply and demand uh, don't match. And this incentivizes then uh, technologies to basically uh, produce energy in these hours and make that money, but also re reduce uh, the gap between supply and demand. There are other hours where the price for the energy is even negative mm -hmm. because the, the energy that is produced by renewable energy sources is not needed. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then producers even uh, pay m uh, to get rid of the energy. Yeah. If you can balance the system, then you ba also balance the price. Yeah. Also, it's fair to say that just because in a uh, one hour or a quarter of an hour the price is at 200 euros or, or higher doesn't mean that over on a yearly basis the prices are higher necessarily. It's simply a, a very, very momentaneous uh, situation that causes these, these prices. And of course, not to forget that we have the situation in Germany that we have cross-border flows as well to other countries. So, of course, we are stepping in if they have outages, yeah. vice versa as well. And that could might sometimes lead to that as well. 
It's a very integrated system, and that's uh, that's a big advantage because you basically you spread the risk of outages, and the weather is sometimes different in different areas, and it helps to balance the overall system. So it's quite quite a good situation that we are connected to our neighbors. Okay, so understood. Storages also play a, a important role in in that regard, mm -hmm. and we always talk about okay, storages is needed. Mm -hmm. um, however. We had some news that uh, Uniper, for example, they applied for a decommissioning of a storage and mm -hmm. uh, in, in Breitbrunn it was. What's the reason for that? Yeah, so, uh, and that sounds uh, a bit counterintuitive at first yeah. because we're talking about security of supply and then the storage is not economic or gas storage is not economic. We need to be aware that when you're talking about gas storage, it's uh, these are big sites. They are either salt caverns, big, really big uh, salt caverns, uh, size of a cathedral where you inject the gas, or they are in many cases old oil and gas fields uh, that are depleted and there's water in it, and now you inject the gas and it pushes the water aside and mm. you can take it out again if you when you need it. So these are huge complex installations that are also expensive to, to run. And currently the market doesn't always pay for the cost of these sites and this is when uh, then uh, operators apply for decommissioning. Mm. And the reason why the market doesn't pay is the, the system is changing, people consume directionally less less gas mm. yeah so sometimes mm. because industry leaves mm. sometimes because people switch to heat pumps and they don't use gas any longer and all this leads and at the same time on the supply side we have LNG which is more flexible than um, some of the pipeline supplies uh, we had in, in in the past and all of this leads to a changing system and then there is an anticipation of the weather uh, and all this leads to a situation where the uh, the spread between summer prices and winter prices, usually that's what pays for storage. You inject in summer in a low price and you uh, extract in, in winter. And if this uh, changes, yeah, then the spread comes so small that it doesn't pay for the storage anymore. Yeah. So still, um, the problem is that if extreme events occur, so it gets much colder yeah, or uh, we, we have outages, so, so something breaks down, etc. Then the, in those extreme situations, we might not have enough gas then available in winter. And mm. that, of course, can be a problem. In your view, what's needed then? Yeah, we need a mechanism then to pay for a reserve. Yeah, it's like an insurance premium. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, the volumes available in, in, in those extreme events. Okay, understood. Yeah, I mean, that probably explains storages um, levels right now as well. Um, I looked it up by the time of the recording, Germany was at 75%. Uh, overall in uh, Europe was 82% versus last year where it was 93%. Mm -hmm. So um, we didn't make the, what was it, 90%. I think that was mm -hmm. the goal for November. So behind that. All right, moving over to the industrial electricity price. That mm -hmm. was uh, something in the news. Our uh, minister for economy, Katharina Reiche, said that this will be in place starting in January next year. Mm. What's behind that? Yeah, I mean, the energy price is, of course, a major problem for the energy intensive uh, industry because it increases the cost for them to uh, um, produce their products. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they're facing a global competition against uh, other countries where energy prices are lower. So namely the Gulf region or the US. Mm -hmm. And a dedicated power price for industry is, of course, a, um, a suitable short-term measure then to mitigate that situation and give us more time then to, mm. uh, to adapt the system. So I think it's understandable that these measures are taken. But of course, we need to take measures as well to long-term mm, st stabilize the, the, the system. Yeah. How do you see it in regards to our decarbonization goals? Isn't that in danger if... Yeah, I mean, in, in theory, markets have a function, which means markets incentivize investments mm. and uh, also saving, for example, uh, on, on, on your energy consumption. So in theory, uh, a high energy price should lead to people investing in the production of energy to yeah. take advantage of these prices or to save energy mm. so they reduce their consumption. So, but these are long-term effects and short-term, this would lead to uh, producers then shutting down production if it's no longer economic e yeah. economy and then they move to other countries. Yeah, And also the uh, situation could be that they move to countries where energy is cheap but uh, environmental 
uh, standards are lower, and mm. and this of course then doesn't help the uh, the, the climate as well. So. Mm. Um, we need to create an equal playing field, and this we don't have at the moment. Okay. Understood. We will definitely keep an eye on what's happening in Berlin and keep the people posted. That's one one little question there, um, because that I think it's important to highlight as well. Considering the the price setter, which n mm -hmm. often is, uh, is is gas in that uh, in that regards, how important is it to have like long term um, security of a certain price level then? Yeah, so in our earlier example, many hours, I mean, the number is going down, but there are many hours where the mm -hmm. gas is setting the price because when you produce uh, with a gas-fired plant in a certain hour or a quarter of an hour, the price to which you bid into the market is then influenced by the gas price. This is how the gas price influences uh, the, the power price in, in these hours. Mm -hmm. So if these prices are extremely high, then of course the, 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 both the gas and the power price will rise. We've seen this in uh, 2022, mm -hmm. where in a situation due to the war um, that had started, the uh, uh, pipeline supplies from Russia were down mm -hmm. and um, everybody tried to fill the storage then before the winter started. And uh, this uh, led to a situation where almost it was any price was paid and yeah. pr gas prices rose to between 200 and 300 euros per megawatt hour yeah. and power prices as a consequence of that uh, over 1000 euros per megawatt hour. Yeah. And we must avoid situations like that. And a long-term contract um, gives you more security of supply and also a certain security on the price level because mm -hmm. you would agree on a price that is not so much influenced by short-term influences. So it would help then to, to stabilize situations like the ones we've seen. Okay, understood. And very interesting topic uh, for sure. Coming to another very interesting topic and I'm looking over uh, mm -hmm. to our guests today. Mm -hmm. We ask Uniper's next generation, our trainees and mm -hmm. apprentices, what are your questions to our chief analyst? And they came up with uh, four questions, um, which I would like to ask you. Um, the first one comes from Anastasia. Um, let's have a look what she wanted to know. Hello, my name is Anastasia and I'm 19 years old. I'm doing my apprenticeship as an office management clerk and I just wanted to know how can digitalization help use energy more efficiently? Yeah, there are many ways. Uh, for example, if we look at the production side, technology, artificial in intelligence, for example, can help them to optimize the, uh, the cost of energy production, for example, maintenance of power plants mm. uh, by anticipating uh, when certain equipments uh, will, will break yeah, and to avoid that. Uh, so we reduce the outage times and then reduce the cost. Mm -hmm. So that's the production side. But also on the, on the demand side. So for example, I have a heat pump in my, uh, in my basement. Mm -hmm. And if I have a technology that finds out if these prices in a quarter of an hour, uh, for example, is high, yeah, so that obviously the system is in in, in, in balance, mm. and then AI can detect that and uh, shut down my heat pump, which I won't even notice because there's a huge water storage in in, in my basement, mm -hmm. so that uh, so I can still still warm, yeah, and so I don't even notice. But the system is uh, then stabilized because technology has helped then to reduce my demand in this situation. Yeah. And similar ideas can apply to charging of electric vehicles, etc., etc. Yeah. So there's a huge potential to make both consumption of energy and supply more efficient and cheaper. Okay, good deal. Moving on to Michael, who has the following question. Hi, my name is Michael, I'm 20 years old, and I'm currently in my second year of my dual studies here at Uniper. And I just wanted to know how Europe's energy security is changing due to the current geopolitical situation. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. And so currently the situation is that uh, all the crises and wars uh, we have in the world have not really pushed the prices uh, up to very high levels because the economic situation is muted. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and that is uh, the case globally. However, there could be situations where these crises uh, affect the prices much more. Mm -hmm. Also, we need to take into account that hybrid attacks on critical infrastructure can lead to outages and, and consequently then to shortages also in energy. So for example, if we look at offshore infrastructure, there has been cables have been damaged by, by ships. Yeah, so we've seen that. So that needs to be protected, but also um, the more the system is digitalized, uh, and that's the example we just discussed with the question from Anastasia, 
then the more it's vulnerable to um, cyber attacks against this infrastructure. So yeah. we really need to protect ourselves both physically and digitally against uh, those attacks because even if it seems all calm, it can escalate in a very short period of time. Yeah, now understood. And I mean, that's why we report on politics here in that format as well, because mm -hmm. it just has a direct impact on, on basically everything within the mm -hmm. energy market. Now coming to the two most, yeah, I would say difficult questions that Emily and Annika came up with. Let's start with Emily. Let's have a listen on what she wants to know. Hello, my name is Emil Wrubleski. I am a dual student here at Unipa. I am doing an apprenticeship to become an industrial clerk. And at the same time, I'm also studying business administration. And my question for today is, what are the biggest challenges in ensuring security of supply and climate protection at the same time? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important one. It's uh, probably the question we have on, on, on the table at the moment. Uh, the biggest challenge is how to finance mm -hmm. both targets. So um, both uh, sustainability, uh, but also security of supply need money. And we have seen in the earlier example about the gas storage that the market is not always prepared to pay for, for security of supply. Similarly, the markets are not always prepared to pay for the sustainability. And the reason is that the cost of, for example, climate change, we will see that much later. And every one of us and also companies then making investment decisions, if they optimize short term, might feel, hmm, can't afford to invest in that aspect right now because it's difficult for me because I can, can't really weigh against the cost of that. So yeah. the cost is then uh, to be borne by society later on, which means then uh, we need to figure out and balance the targets we've got we, because we probably as a society don't have the funds, the money to achieve all of our goals. Yeah. No, and, um I know that this is yeah, a thumbs up. I already saw that. Mm -hmm. I think, like you said, it needs to be a priority. And, and unfortunately, some things always move ahead of the list uh, in, in cases of uh, yeah. crisis mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So definitely uh, an interesting and very important point for our future. Annika wants to know. My name is Annika Klose. I'm 18 years old and I'm a dual student studying business administration and an industrial clerk apprentice at Unifa. My question is, what needs to happen to completely switch to renewable energies and is it even possible? So I would say we can drive it much further than where we are today. So, um, and for me, the question is, is less, can we in theory do it? I think, uh, I mean, if you have a lot of batteries and renewable energy, I mean, that's in theory, of obviously is possible. It might not be efficient. So we need to figure that out against our other priorities. But I think we can do much more, as explained previously, than we have today. And the question is more than how quickly can we drive it further and how much can we, can we achieve? It's more a, a question of uh, feasibility against the various conflicting targets we have as society, social targets, political targets. Uh, sustainability targets and uh, to balance that on the path forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, Annika. I hope that thumbs up as well. So. Great. Well, much better questions that I usually ask you. Uh, so, yeah, so we should bring them in more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to highlight to you out there as well. Um, in case you're interested of um, becoming a part of Unipa, um, we have a great apprentice and trainee program. So I will make sure to list the corresponding links uh, here as well. Anyways, thanks for your questions, by the way. And Diego, thanks for your answers. Yeah, thank you, Florian, for having me. And then see you next time around. See you next time. Um, to you out there, thank you for watching. See you also next time around. Um, just in case you don't want to watch us anymore, you can now listen to us uh, as well on uh, Audible, Apple and Spotify. See or hear you next time as well. Until then, bye bye.